Well guys, I do like a bit of beach fishing. As hard as it's been, as tough as it's been, rock hard up my way, I got in the car. I didn't get in the car first. I made a few phone calls down to West Somerset where Craig Butler has always been. He does a pro guide um, and he knows the tides and everything down here. West Coast Tackle, I think they run. And we're down here at this spot. Look, this is, this is what, more what it's like. Now the tide down here in the Bristol Channel goes out like you wouldn't believe. And this is halfway down to Neep's tide. So it's small, but fabulous setting. Unbelievable setting, not another angler in sight. Well, there is. Craig's over there. He's just changed it to a different type of pulley rig we just set up. Charlie's over there. He's just set up as well. We've got rods in the water on there by the umbrella, obviously. Um, and we're going to give it a go. There's a chance, wait, there's a chance of some small schooly bass. Listen, after my exploits on the bridge, I will take anything. Worse, it started raining pretty well wet here. And look at the scenery, though. It's worth coming for. Look at the rock face that's come down, the whole landscape's come down, beautiful green. This is shelter from our prevailing southwesterly winds, I think, this side. Um, and that's why it's lovely and green up there. And you can see all the rock fall there, and it's got this beautiful sand here, because being flat, this is going to come in fast, it's going to go out fast. So let's just go across, have a chat with Craig, and then we'll have a, a chat with Charlie. The tide at the moment, we're at the bottom of the tide, it's about three o'clock in the afternoon. We're just going to give it three hours fishing here with a flood tide and see if we can't pick anything up and then we're going to move somewhere else but this place we called it the secret beach it's in a film before we're just going to see if we can scratch something out here for you to show you guys a fish or two huge boulders over there you can see big boulders and the rain please just stop for three hours so craig what are you up to there mate uh just just baiting up a, an up and over rig with a with a launch um so hopefully pick up a ray and like a bigger bait than the rays, really? Yeah, they, they would take all sorts of size baits, really, to be fair, but um, that's what we got with us today. So just a nice launch. So good size bait, really, isn't it? Not bad, is it? What hook size there? What you uh, want? I've, what got you a, I've got a 3 3 mustard viking hook on there. Sure. Um, one of my favourite rigs for the Bristol Channel. Uh, good strong hook, stays sharp. Um, never let me down over the years. So. And then you just slide, so the beginners now, you just slide that, pe it's yeah, a sliding I've, panel hook, that top one. It is, it? yeah. I've basically got the fixed hook on there, which I just nicked in. Yep. And basically I've elasticated the, the line and the hook yep. shank to the eel. Um, I've worked it all the way up to there. And then the top panel rig was attached with a bit of neoprene tubing. Just going to slide that down and just going to thread that in there like so just you're going up you're going under the elastic there aren't you? yeah just yeah, that's nick a it little in. secret you didn't tell yeah, us yeah just nick it in yes. there nick it round then pull that access loop up that will sit nicely on there bit more thread on there then a little bit more fine cotton i'd basically pinch the tail um i'll snip the tail off in a minute but before i do that i'm just going to pinch it onto there so i can hold it in place sure find the elastic that is the thing not to lose the elastic and you've got a that's nice it. big black spool that's, that's giving it. me no idea good stuff this the tronix pro batex it's, a, it's not elastic it's a it's a latex oh a latex uh, so it stretches the same oh, it's fantastic it? the strength strength over the fineness is amazing just a couple of turns on there nip it off and you cut the tail off for what the, reason yeah, uh, spinning stop it spinning yeah, yeah. If, you, if you don't nip the tail off it will it will spin in the air and ultimately could just cause tangles We'll just nip that off and then uh optional thing i quite like to do it um just behind the eyes eyes here just yeah. nip nip that off just behind the gills and there's a lot of blood just behind the gills there it's still frozen a little bit but once that you can just start seeing it start, the blood start to move now there you go guys a yeah. somerset tip for you there if ever i saw one uh the rig of choice today i'm using an up and over rig um basically it's got a the presentation of a running ledger which is probably probably one of the best presentations you're going to get uh, especially on a flat clean beach uh, basic comprises of about 50 centimeters of a shock leader or rig body I think it's about 70 80 pound there uh, starting in a, a rig clip uh, if I take this off here you'll be able to see it better starting in a rig clip uh, we'll hook him on there for convenience runs down to a bead then a swivel link which for the lead to attach to and another bead and you can see it runs between there and there so it's almost running or semi fixed running then we've got the hook length which is just under double the length of the rig body got to be less though isn't it it's got to be less it's got to be, be less, less than that yeah. Yeah. anything you know an inch or two two or three centimeters less is important um 
and I'll show you the reason why for that in a second. To set to, to clip it down, you have to go up, hence the up and over rig. Yeah. So up over that clip there, and it comes down and will clip onto the impact lead here. If that rig body was too long, it, you wouldn't be able to clip onto it. Yes. It, it yeah. wouldn't work. So it's got to be got to be just under double the. A couple length. inches below yeah, the, uh, the below length. the uh, length yeah. of that clip. That's it. That'd be fine. And obviously, when when this hits the water, that impact shield goes up there, releasing it, and that falls off. Like so, giving you a lovely presentation. And it basically gives you a nice long trace as well, yeah. doesn't it? We just lay them on the on the seat on the beach. Here you can see. It will just go out to cast, just like so, and they just lays out on the beach, away from the lead. If you you could use a pulley rig, the same sort of similar effect, but you could find that your sand hill could land up with the lead and it could potentially put fish off but perfect presentation on a clean sandy beach now mr stupid here has been using those little clips to uh to put your bait on but i didn't know really what the other clips are for and the clip at the top craig tell us that one that you leave that on the line so the end of your line comes through the rub ring here yeah well, and you leave here. that so you can change rigs all the time yeah this one here is just um basically that's, that's your shock leader obviously here um the rig clip on here and it's just basically convenience for unclipping on a rig, unclipping it. Yeah. So if you're double patting, which is having a spare rig baited up all the time, so when you reel in, you can unclip your lead and then clip a fresh one straight on and sure. cast back out. Um, just maximising the time the baits are in the water. Uh, show the two clips in close up. If you can get it closer, you can see this one doesn't have the bait holder on it. Yep. This one actually... Very, very similar there. Yeah. One's got obviously a bait clip on. Um, in other words, I'm utilising a bait clip yep, for the, the up top. and over yeah. rig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're so, reversing it almost, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, so, yeah. We've got it now, got it. And Just to show you clip on there and it'll clip off. It's so easy to do. Brilliant. Saves lots of hassle. hassle. I'm, I'm just going to pop this just into the surf, probably sort of like 40, 50 metres out. I'm going to aim to to walk this rig back. Uh, we've got deeper water at 50, 40, 50 metres than we have at 60, 70 metres because there's a sandbar uh, which pops up further out. So we really don't want to be on top of that. We want to be sort of in the gutter of it, really. I'm on top of it, Craig. Pardon? Am I on top of it? <laughs> no, I think you'll be fine. <laughs> we might get lost, don't I? Yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah, there's a stone ridge even further out, but we'll be fine for that. So it's going to come out and just walk in the water a few metres. Uh, the reason for the walk back uh, on this beach is it, it's a very flat, flat beach um, and you'll be forever casting and reeling in. Uh, when the tide turns it does fly in here so hence I'm just going to cast out and walk it back and I could end up with 150 yards of, 160 yards of, of, um, of line out. Uh, just giving me the benefit of not having to cast every five minutes but hopefully we'll pick a fish up. I'll have to cast again. And it's not going to bury in the sand like up um, our way if we did that shingle not, fish not and it would bury the it. The sand's quite hard here. You do, you do sort of, once you pull the line out through it, it should be fine. Bites can come in various forms. Uh, here they could be mainly, mainly slat line bites here. When the tide starts to move quite hard from the left to right, uh, the fish can pick it up and move with the tide and come in short, come in tight um, and will result in the slack line bites so if you see your line fall slack oh, yeah, and yeah. they just wind yeah, down that's it. Yeah, like crazy you, yeah if you get slack line just just like say wind like crazy not a minute to spare not a second to spare because you know you don't want the fish to drop but guys a few tips for you there already let's hope we get some fish to bag it up something's got to happen we're going to go and see charlie see if he's got any tips for you as well here at totally awesome there must be one or two tips see what we can find out for you so Charlie, this looks new to me. I mean, what's all this about? Um, well, it's just a simple uh, bait tray, really, to keep everything where you want it. Um, got so you know, disgorgers here, little baiting tool, bait elastic, got a few spare leads, baiting needles, scissors, and my bait. Got the lids on just to keep the rain off. It's a bit drizzly. That's a good idea, isn't it? That folds in half by the look of it as well. Doesn't yeah, it? folds in half. Obviously, the tripod all folds up. Fits nicely in the box. Um, and it's just handy for a day like today where your box is miles away miles away yeah and uh, yeah, it keeps everything nice and tidy right next to your rod and you're not using a tripod Charlie no no I've got a sand spike today um, it, well we're fishing on sand it pushes in easy holds the rod nicely 
um, and you don't have to trek it for miles over the fields like we have been. Now I've got to tell you, he's a specialist match fisherman. I, I've got to show you this line lay, it's just immaculate. What's this about a shot? I've never seen a reel in my life with line lay like that. Is that, <laughs> is that a special reel? Is it a special spool? Is it a special line? Tell no, us what it is. No, that is, um, well it's the Tronics Virtuoso XT. I think it's about an 80 quid reel. Um, so no extortionate pricing? No, no, they're superb. Uh, and the spools, spools that they go with fit, um, I think the new Shimano Ultegra XSDs, they fit your, your Shimano Fleegans, your higher end reels, the bullseyes. They all um, fit, they're all interchangeable? All interchangeable with the Tronics reels um, for 80 quid. Well, I've got rid of all my 400 quid reels. Have you really? Over those. there? Yeah. Now, the other thing that bothers me is you've just walked out I'll show you how far he is. He's miles out there. He's cast out. How come there's so much line on this ball? You must have a fine diameter. It's not too fine. I've gone 0.25 diameter today because there's a chance of a, a you know, four or five pound ray um, and in the tide. What's that in breaking strain to? Uh, just I, approximate, would you? 10s, 15s? Two, five would be about eight pound, I think. Wow. I literally have no idea on the breaking strains because I all go diameter now. Yes. Um, don't even look at the breaking strain when I'm looking at a line. Shock leader? Shock leader got a tape, uh, a Yuki tapered shock leader, which goes from point, I think got a 2.3 it starts at, but I've cut it back to, to match the 0.25 and it goes to 0.57, um, which is, you know, plenty strong enough for, for any. And that looks leader. like a sort of match type of rod, but is it pokey? Tell us what that is and what it casts. Um, it, well, it's the Yuki Kenta Neox, um, 4.2 metre. It casts, or just have to check this now. Yeah, I yeah. Think. Yeah, rated up to 250 grams. Um, I mean, my optimum weight on it is it's back between four and five ounce. It's, it's a lovely rod. It will cast the 250 grams, and equally it will cast the 100 grams. Uh, well, in fact, I'm fishing 100 grams on it now. Good sensitivity on the tip as well, I imagine, yeah? Yeah, it's, I'll give, give the line a little. It's, it's, it's all you need, really. Um, it's not, not too much. You know, it, the tip complements the blank perfectly. Um, I, I particularly, when I'm match fishing, I'm looking at my rod, but not necessarily looking at the tip, because um, if you get, a, if, well, I'm always near my rod, and sure. out the corner of your eye, you can always see your rod. You go. see something go, don't yeah. you? Yeah, your peripheral yeah. vision, you can always. What's that? Is that a bite? Yeah, yeah, that's it. If I was fishing, you know, for particularly finicky fish or yes. or in really close, I'd have a finer tip rod, um, and I'd be staring at. While I'm baiting up, I'll be staring at the tip, you know, constantly. But as long as you're near near enough to your rod, you'll know. You just you just get a sense and look up and the tip's going. Yeah, you see that movement, don't you? Yeah. And a nice big ball handle I see on this, the grip. Yeah, oh, it's it's, it's brilliant. Um, you know, you can get a nice firm grip on it if you're fishing, say for the bigger stuff and you need a proper winch and you can. But and how? And another thing I find I'm going to ask this. I'm going to ask this guys because I have the problem of oh my god, he's got a fish. What do you think? It's got a bit of a bend on there, isn't he? He's probably got my line. Let's. Get, I'll keep talking to Charlie. Oh man, no! Oh no! Look what's coming in, Charlie! Ton of weed! Yeah. Oh no! But I mean, on these spools that are on this type of spindle here, yep. when I'm cranking on a load of weed, or when I occasionally do get a big fish, I notice they move. So would that be not a real big heavy fish type of reel? Is it more small to medium sized fish? It depends on the reel you get. Um, it's all down to the reel construction. These are pretty sturdy. He's yep. got a little fish actually. Got a bass, oh, he's I got think. a little bass. Yeah. Let's go and see this. We're going to see Craig. He's got a fish there. First fish of the trip. Sorry about this, Charlie. Sorry about this. Just leave him in mid-flight there, Charlie. He's got a little schoolie and he's got the weed as well. Now, I don't mind weed and fish. It's when you get weed and weed and weed that I don't like. Right on, Craig. First fish. Yeah, first cast. Little bass. Not the, not the biggest one we were after, but... It will do, for start. The bass is the bass, isn't it? Yeah. As he's only a small fish, we'll unhook him carefully. And that couldn't have been more than, what, 40 yards out, something yeah, like that? Yeah, probably 20, 30 years one, actually. Yeah, very, very close. So just, yeah. guys, you don't need to cast a long way for some of these fish. Nice little school bass. Well, I was getting back quite quick. Obviously, with, um, with the bass catch and release now, everything's got to go back. So it's imperative we respect those laws as, as recreational anglers and get these back in the water to grow on. There he goes. Hopefully, guys, let's get the head cam on. I just walking back. I was just walking back. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I do now. I definitely, definitely. I was, I was down there with Craig. My God, the lucky hat's come off. Don't forget, get yourself one of these. You never know what luck it could bring you. Well, we hope so anyway. I definitely saw a rattle on this rod. That is a grip lead. I'm hoping, there he is, there he is. There's a rattle there. Oh, maybe I missed him. Now what I do guys, I just leave, if I've missed that fish, I'm gonna leave it out. I 100% saw a rattle on that, so I'm gonna leave it out and see if he comes back to it. That one was on a grip lead, I've got a grip lead on there. And this one was the one I want to go. That's got a sand hill, just a plain bomb on it. And it's now pulling slightly to the right. The current now, you can see it. And there's a little bit of wind, huge black thunderclouds. Luckily it's over whales. I'm just going to hold this rod there because I definitely think that that fish was up there. Watch that rod, Smith. Smith, watch that rod top for me. I definitely see that rod top just tugged in. He tugs again. I'm going to wheel him in. Craig's off out. Have another cast. Do you know what I'm going to wheel it in anyway, boys? I just love surf fishing. There's no surf here, guys. Look, it's, it's pretty flat, calm. All these little waves coming in. Very, very coloured water, but there's something about. Just fishing in the plain water, you've got a pair of waders on. You're in amongst the fish's element. Oh, I've got that drag set. I might have my other line. I did make a mistake of casting the two together. And I've got one with a grip lead and one with a, a plain bomb. So always cast the plain bomb down tide or downwind or down current and where you've got your fixed lead so you don't pull one into the other or indeed any weed doesn't crank into the other. I see my shock leader coming through the uh, through the water there. Oh yes, there's a kick, there's a kick, oh there's a kick. It's only a small fish, probably hopefully the same size as Craig's. Oh my god guys, I'm so excited. I've actually I've actually got a fish potentially. Mind you sometimes you can get the, the, the prongs of the grip lead um, just uh, tweaking in the sand and giving a false impression. Oh no, I see one, one worm, two worm, oh god no, there's, there's nothing. Oh my god. How in, look at that. Look at that, there was a fish on there. No, no, believe me, you've got to believe. Please, <laughs> please somebody believe me. I know there was a fish there. Bit of weed. Well, that's what I've got. I've got little, little flash blades on there. There's a sequence further up, but that's hopefully what you can see. There's my grip lead. As the bait was on. See the worm at the top? Now I'm too far out to bring that back, but I'm going to wade out a bit deeper, hopefully not get a booty. And fingers crossed. Oh, that was good close. Just give it a heave ho out there. The fish was on that top hook. I can see he's pulled the worm right down. Craig's marching away there. He's keen. He wants to get another bass. What we'd like to see is a little ray or something like that. But listen, we've seen one fish anyway. But what a setting I'm fishing in. Short session, but at the right time with the right people. Makes all the difference. And I'm just walking back here, the bait. Now, hopefully I've got my um, grip lead on the uptide side of the sandal, which is ungripped, just a plain, plain bomb, just a plain bomb. I do like this walk back technique because, you know, as a tide comes in, you're a long way out. See now if I was watching my rod top instead of filming, I've probably got that little bass, which is what I'm fairly sure it is. Now I missed yet another fish for you people on YouTube. It's shocking. It cost me so many fish over the years. That's better. Right, switch these over. Bit of a breeze coming now. Not a bad thing, because hopefully that will keep the thunderstorms at bay. Now you might have looked earlier on and look at how quick that tide's come in, boys. Really quick, Craig's, Craig's gonna move his, look, it's, we were talking there minutes ago and it's coming already. So time to put the lucky awesome hat on. Wouldn't I think I've got to wear it to get the best luck out of it. I took it off to put the head cam on 
and I miss that little bass. I'm going to walk these back now. Look at this, this is how sad it is. Umbrella. I feel like I should be waiting on Kingston Station in London or something. So undo the drags and then hopefully if that's loose enough you just pull your tripod out like this and I just tend to, to drag it back. <clears throat> now this is a grip lead so he's stuck in the sand but the bomb I don't want to move so I'm just walking this right back and I pull the bomb one off you see I'm pulling a line off manually by the bomb otherwise it will probably drag the bomb in that'll do me dig that spike in just get those front legs down if you'll pardon the expression ladies just get that drag tightened up I must not drop this microphone in the salt water I've done a couple for Mike strange I thought I saw that rod vibrate then and here we are now this is walk back see how far I've walked back from up here probably walk back another 30 yards so I'm probably fishing I don't know so I cast 80 I've walked back 40 probably 150 yards out and there's nowhere I can cast that far with a four ounce weight yeah, there's a bite there. You reckon he's got it? I'd have him definitely. That's on his whole sandals, one of your special yeah. sandals. Definitely bait sandals. <laughs> you reckon he's on there? I don't know. Yeah, I'll tell you this. Hopefully I haven't got my other line as well. <laughs> yeah, not one falling off there. Where am I? Well, hopefully I haven't got my other line there. Eh? I don't see the rod. I think, right. I, think I uh, might put grips on both now, otherwise it's going to swing me in those rocks over there. Definitely got a fish here. I'm quite old away from the other eye. Am I? Yeah. Oh, no, it's kicking now. Little bass, is he? You're right, I'm amazed that bite he gave out, Gray. Gave out of a bite for a small fish, didn't he? Oh no, it's my worm one. Sorry, I thought it was on a sandal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. I don't even know what look this angle. I don't know what tackle he's using. He's still catching the fish. I'll get a photo. I'll get a photo. See, and you see, I've got that that little spinner there. Oh, I can hold him sideways if you want. No, it's just the light is really bad. I'll put it against the green there. Go, you go. You go that side. Oh, that's better. That's better. You say where you want him. Three, two, one. Lovely. Got him. Let's get him back. <laughs> Save the blank. Yeah. I thought it was a sand on my sandal, that's why I let him bang away. There he goes. So many bass that about that size. I'll say they're about four, four or five years old now. And uh, this is way before any of the bass protection stuff. Yes. Right? Basically, that's that year class. There's so many of them. Oh, that's really? Gonna, that's going to support the bass fishery for the next 15 years. Thing I'm on again, guys. I just don't need to have this mic fall off in the water like I've had before. I've got a chunk of weed. I've got nothing on the sandal. I thought the sandal was on the uh, last time I had it. Well, maybe he's got off. Oh no! I did put the rod down to put the camera. No, he's a fish here. Yeah. And all that ball of weed is on the leader knot. So that's going to stop me winding my line onto the uh, reel. That's probably going to jam any time. No, give a little shake. I don't want to shake the bass off. Here comes the bass. It's another little scooty bass. He's even, he's hooked in the, th in the throat. I saw the bite and he's just hooked underneath there. Let's show him to you. Listen, don't spike me. Look at his fins come up because I grabbed him. Only a tiny little bass. But listen, after what I've been catching, a fish is a fish is a fish. Away you go. Get that weed off. Let's get out there again, boys. Tide's pushing in fast. Ah, he's got a fish on down here. Charlie's on. Here he comes. Oh. He's out there.
There we go. Charlie, that cannot be the size of your fish hook. Yeah. So, uh, what size is that? That's a size four wormer hook. My, it goes tiny. Look at what you can catch with a small hook, guys. <laughs> well done, good show. A bit more water. There we go. That's good, eh, mate? There we go. Oh, look, a missile. But tell us about uh, the actual bite, seeing a bite. Well, on a three down rig, seeing a bite, um, it's as simple as it'll either uh, smash your tip over drop your line back or you just won't see it um, simply because I mean I'm fishing a relatively short rig for me today on a three down a 10 foot but that fish has got a 10 foot radius around the lead to, to swim before it even registers before it even registers um, so yeah it's got 10, 10 foot to swim or 20 foot really 10 foot radius to yeah, swim around without feeling the lead um, so I very rarely look at the rod for a bite and if you do by that time, by the time it feels the lead, it'll be pretty annoyed and it'll be given a pretty good bite. Good like that bite. one did, just slap the line down. Sure. Um, and I very rarely fish a, a tight line to my lead. Oh, um, really? Because it just gives the fish a little bit if you're not too tight. But obviously with this, you've given it enough anyway. So a free down is the only time I really deliberately fish tight to the lead. Um, so it's brilliant when there's weed. A lot of people wouldn't fish this long when there's weed. Yeah. Um, what you got to think, say, if, well, we're fishing anywhere, there's, there's quite a lot of weed. You want your rod tip high out the water, but you want your baits on the floor. Well, stick a big gripper on there so it's anchored in. Then all the weed that catches on your line, that would, say if you had a hook up the top of your rig like you normally would, all the weed's going to come down and cover that hook, say if it was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas now the weed's going to slide all the way down, yeah, so hit the lead, did. and then you've got... Bait's still clear. Bait's still clear. And as you may have noticed, reeling in that bass, because um, a lot of people were saying, oh, how does it tangle? Does it tangle a lot? Only really tangles when you've got a fish on it, so it's worth the tangle. Absolutely, I can um, see that, yeah. And, I mean, I have... I mean, in my box today, I've only brought seven or eight with me, but usually if I was planning on fishing them for a whole session or a match, I'd have about 20 um, all ready to go on the rig winders. Don't worry about casting them as well. That's one main people's biggest fear with them is casting them because you've got all this yes and they think that it's going to catch you when you, you lay it on the floor behind you so you're casting off the deck you put it all Ca on the, on the, on the, on the sand ground. yep um but you've got to remember those baits are going to follow the lead yep. the lead doesn't hit you in the head the rig's not simple as that um and i'll just give this one a cast out now and show you how i cast it Well, oh, boys, getting a bit damp down here now. Craig's got another one. Right. Have a small one, Craig. Yeah. Had a real banging bite just then, guys. I probably missed it. Craig's just missed one. We're filming not over the so we missed so many fish when we're filming. Just no, I think there's a fish there. Could be another schoolie bass. Hell of a bite. Here he is, see him in the surf out there. I'm gonna go out and meet him. Oh, it's a little tad, a little tad, a tad bigger. Here he comes on the surf. A tad bigger guys. Hopefully you can see that one. Yeah. Again, they just hooked in the bottom where he smashed at the worm or even these sequins might have attracted him. Just a nice little bass there. I mean, look, in that setting, with that surf, bar of silver. Jim spiked me, I'm only going to release him. There he goes. Gone. Just there. There he is. Boom. worth uh, every, every cast changing the fresh freshening the bait up um, 
strip off any chewed up worm and uh, just replace it with fresh. Uh, I'll probably in the winter for cod fishing, I'd probably like leave just top top the lug baits up. But as we're fishing for the bass with with ragworm, they've, most of them have had a good old chew, so it's worth just stripping them off and putting a fresh one on. You could use a baiting needle to make life easier, but even for the worms. Yeah, but it's alright. He's on there. Send him yeah. out. Yeah, fresh worm. I'd be saving those, Craig. Huh? I'd be saving all those, <laughs> no mate. Yeah, what a setting. Wow. The rain stopped, the sea is like a sheet of glass. We're getting pushed up into these rocks, way over there is where the boys have dumped their gear. And we're going to work that way because the tide will cut us off. We won't cut us off back here, we'll have a longer walk. And just cast along the edge of those rocks and they should still get bass coming into this bay here. Oh, what's wrong walking? I'll be over in Wales in a minute. I'd rather not have a crack off, if possible. <gasps> that was a close one, Graham. Waves are getting bigger, boys. I'm going to let this one go through and then I'm going to cast. Oh, oh, oh. I can't afford to get wet because I'm going to be sleeping in the car tonight. Hopefully going out early in the morning on my own to fish another mark that Craig's given me. So if I could have a couple of hours sleeping in my car, that would be great. Doing the walk back technique. See, uh, Charlie's now starting to work along the coast here this way. So we're working up there and it's gradually closing us down and we're working back down this way up on those boulders. Eventually we'll probably finish with our rods on the boulders and casting onto the sand. That is apparently the procedure here. Well, three bass on that, bloody hell. Hell fire. I'm on fire. It's all because I've got the lucky hat. During the summer, uh, looking after your bait is, is, is really important. Uh, get yourself a a cool bag, it's an IMAX one, there's, there's several on the market, it's from several different um, bait companies, it's irrelevant which one you buy, Just it's best to invest in one. Um, in the heat, especially the heat we've been having lately, uh, bait can be destroyed in a matter of hours. You go out fishing, um, set up, bait up with your fresh bait, it's all good, hour into the session it's all cooked, dead, whatever, so you've, you've got to look after it and manage your bait wisely, especially during a session. Um, personally, uh, this is what I like to do, I've got, uh, in here I've got um, lots of paper to pack out the space if I'm not using all the space. I've got some ragworm, uh, which are really susceptible to dying in heat. I basically lined uh, a maggot box uh, with, with uh, newspaper and I've got my ragworm in here uh, with a bit of shredded newspaper just to take up any moisture they might um, expel. Um, I keep that sat in, in the box here. Uh, which is all nice. I don't use cool packs in here uh, because the, the cold of the cool packs can kill the ragworm, basically giving them hypothermia. Uh, it might only take 10 minutes to set in, it might die, they might die within an hour of, of setting up. But in the top section, I've got fresh bait and an ice pack in here, um, which will add, add a bit of coolness to it to keep the cool coolness, but not too much. Lugworms okay, you say? Lugworm, yeah, you can use use cool packs with lugworm. They're they're fine with that. They can they can tolerate the heat, tolerate the coldness, but ragworm can't deal with it. And the same as somebody have fresh peeler crabs. You know, if they did pick their own, what what are they like for keeping? Yeah, they're fine. Keep the peeler crabs in a maggot box, um, and but they're, they're fine with an ice pack. Um, yeah. Wise to do that if you if you you know they could find that it will keel over and die if kept too if they're too hot. Um, so I always recommend keeping them in a bait box in a cool bag during the summer. Boy, Craig's got something different here. Look, they're all. They're swarming around it. You guys are swimming. Oh, this is nice. So you've got tubs, red streaks. Yeah, I think it's a tub girded, this one. Beautiful uh, colours on it. Good little bite. It was quite positive it was another bass, but... That is beautiful colours in that one, isn't it? Look at the big st pectors. Stunning, aren't they? And pretty unusual off the shore, really, I'd say, isn't it, Craig? Yeah, or? you don't get many of them, but this time of year you do, you do get a few come in, but... Nice to see for species count, isn't it? Absolutely, something different, yeah. 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 Spiny thing as well. Nice. And a good, good bite too. It was, yeah. Well, 
Well people, we've moved beaches, totally different area behind me. We've come down to fish. Well, let's give you an update first. I think we finished with four, five, six, seven, eight or nine bass. Only small ones we know, but listen, eight or nine bass is eight or nine bass. Probably worth 16 of another species. Plus, Craig got that nice gurnard. We've got George over here, he's come down with us. We're now spinning just with lures. Charlie's uh, lure fishing as well, and I'm going to be lure fishing. I'm going to be using this. We're about two hours from high water. Oh, it's bent down. It's nowhere easy to walk in Somerset, that's the trouble. There's all other boulders and stuff. Spinning rod, I think it's a Tokushima. My old kanji rod, and I'm going to be using one of those wedge lures there that the other guys have got on, um, like a sort of sidewinder lures. Uh, quite big, quite big, but I just fancy a small one. I'm going to try a small one. I think I'm on 10 pound line straight through here. And as you can see, if I turn that around and I just static the pole, you can see a huge, massive boulder bank here. Massive, right? There is a bay, beautiful bay here. Headland, greenery all the way down, because again, I think it tucks in here and it's sheltered from the prevailing storms of southwesterlies. Little baby miniature harbour over there. Come back a bit. On the other side is the Welsh coast, so this is all the Bristol Channel. George is down there in the White Hat fishing down there. Charlie's way up here in the mouth of the creek. Now what apparently has happened, now, I've never been here before but this is what I'm told, a storm breached through here. It burst right through this massive bank and made a huge swamp-like area. Well, it's not a swamp, it's like a lagoon in the farmland behind. So it's a channel, so there's a massive influx of salt water. The whole ocean goes through this channel now and they've never, I guess, filled it back in or maybe they can't fill it back in. So consequently, any fish, little fish that go in there as a nursery, got to go through this channel here. That's right, bass are predators. They're going to know there's small fish in that channel. They could be feeding on a little baby mullet. Nobody really seems to know, but we're going to give it a go. It's spinning, it's lure fishing, try and finish this session off, maybe, with another bass, my beauties. The sand here is unbelievably red. Just look at that down there. Absolutely like a bright red sand, followed by, yes, more boulders. I'm going to try to the right. Apparently this is all going to cover here and then we'll be fishing over the top. I fancy that middle lagoon there so that's where I'm going to set up. Got my bag of lures and in there is some grub as well. It has been a very long day for Uncle Graham but we never give up. The guys did say it's slightly coloured the water so we don't really know if we're going to catch but listen it's worth a shot isn't it? It's either that or sit and get bored watching telly at home. Sooner be out. I'm going to put my gear here. This tide comes in so fast here in the Bristol Channel. That's come in <laughs> since I set the camera tripod up. Check drag, Graham. Concentrate. I'm going to fire out this uh, wedge. Hopefully, I'm not going to lose it in the bottom. I'm going to try and watch how fast George and that is uh, working their lure. There's a fair chance I'm going to lose this. It's just the way it is in fishing. But I've got others there. I notice they're both on weedless. No, I think George has gone to a, a wedge because he thinks they, they might see the flash better. Oh, I'd like to see one of these guys get a fish. Then let it sink too, too deep. I'm just doing quite a fast retrieve here. I'm just tweaking the rod top, trying to make it flutter. I can only talk for the way I fish these wedges before. You sort of have the oh, oh. you saw it on the tail or some fishing snag show, and the wet booty show. Oh, I'm going to put it back, I think. Probably might straighten the hooks on that one, so this area is shallow. Beware. No, all good. Well, guys, it's been... The evening of 5,000 casts. 
I've seen one small bass, I think it was a bass, about 20, 20 yards out, just swirled on the top. I think it was a bass. It could have been a mullet. This could have been a mullet. It's a lovely flat evening. Chance of a thunderstorm by the look of it. The other lads are down there, no shouts. They're all uh, flailing away with the lures. So <coughs> I haven't changed lure. I'm still stuck on that wedge there. No need to change because uh, George's got a wedge. George's got a wedge. Sounds like he's a multi-millionaire full of money. He's got money. George's got a wedge. The drinks are on me, George. And then Charlie further around the corner is using like a sidewinder type lure, just a, like a latex lure, quite large, weedless, I think. And we're catching nothing. The tide is coming in. We've got maybe half an hour, 40 minutes left. But I've got one more throw of the cards. I'm going to try and grab a few hours sleep in the car. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a laugh, won't it? Horizontal laying on the car. Got a little bed in there, might be able to get a couple hours sleep and hit the beach behind Craig's tackle shop on the pier at Minehead. Um, he said that could be quite good. There. He's told me a mark to go to. He's left me his bait box, his bait bag there. So I've got some bait. So if we don't get anything tonight, it looks like Skunksville is on the way. It does look like Skunksville. And that's one of those guys shouts. We'll see you guys when I get back to the car. Fabulous evening though. Look, he's coming in a bit peculiar, isn't he? Yeah. But the main thing is he's coming in. Hey! He was on there. Yeah. Witness, we got it. We got it on camera. Yeah. <laughs> we had one. Good one. Yeah. Well, you got a few hours of sleep in the car, people, which is nice. And as you can see, it is a luxury hotel. That's why I like estate cars, is because I can get a camp bed full size inside, stretch out, nothing worse. Of course, I've slept in cars over the years. Of course, I have. No, I'm not a tramp. It's just what fishermen do now and then. It's not the same when you're jammed in the front seats sitting up with the vertical oh no excuse me but here's my view here's my office the sun's just coming up and my view across the back outside there is of the tide coming in boats in the hillside there I think I'm going to get up, get a rod out. I've got three hours of uh, flood tide coming up and then three hours down on this mark. That's what Craig was telling me. Fish three up, three down. And he's going to, uh, he's going to be rocking up about, I think, about midday. And we might be able to find somewhere else and squeeze another few hours in. So we're desperately trying to find you some fish, boys. So we're down to blank last night other than that bass that George lost right when they were pinged out right at the last knock-ins they stayed on they I, I couldn't I had to come home home this is where I live I had to come back pack up I was tired not driving my age should be doing all this really but it's got to be done so let's get out there if I can get out oh dear Either the child lock's on or the alarm's going to go off. I'm going to have to climb right through the front and get out, if I can. I mean, oh, the weirdest dreams. Man alive, whatever goes through my brain when I'm awake. You don't want to know what goes through it when I'm asleep. But it's worth getting up for that. Look at that. 
big cargo ship out there as well. Right, see so if I can find a way out the inside of this car. Oh, I nearly forgot to show, show you guys what I'm rigging up with. I've got a single hook pulley panel rig, put two baits on and a tangle. Okay, on this one, if you can see that, I've got a fillet of mackerel elasticated on there, make a nice big bait there. And here, I'm just about threading one of the big ragworm, let's come that way for you, up and over to make a decent bait. And I'm going to top that with a sand eel. I'm going to roll a sand eel around there, and then I'm going to bend the rest of the worm around there. Hand wipes. Bait thread and hand wipes are the bane of my life when I'm sea fishing. I don't seem to use it quite so much coarse fishing. And I'm going to bind, if you can see, the ragworm to that sand eel. Not too tight that the thread cuts through the ragworm. Just look at the back of the car. There's an old age pensioner lives in there. Been in there years. All he does is fish. I wish that'd be the easy part, fishing. So you see, I'm trying to keep this nice and straight. I'm going to go round the bend of that hook a couple of times, stop it sliding down the bend. Nice and tight around the hook, but not tight around the, the worm. Might get lucky today, you don't know. Half hitch. I've got to get some more bait through to get through this stuff like crazy. Put it there, Graham, so you know where it is. That is one juicy, gunky bait. Now, Craig... Craig had that tip which I learned, so just snip that tail off and just snip a bit of the nose off which lets a bit of juice out. Let's get down there as you can see that's where I'm off to or not. I also shorten my uh, leaders up a little bit here no, I say shorten the lead, just so they take less turns around the spool. This could be the mark from hell or the mark from heaven, depending whether I can A, hold bottom, and B, I'll just show you, look, there's the cars, the cars right there. And there's the beach. Craig said, there's an old Orkney boat here. He's giving me permission to fish here, by the way, guys. And crikey, I could nearly I could nearly put the tripod here, cast and bring it back on crikey, I could watch it from the car. Let's get down there. Somebody's been down here, I can see, look, broke, all broken up on the bank. I'm gonna leave my rods here, people, because that tide's coming in. Man, that'll be convenient. I can have breakfast with the sunrise and I'm going to go that way a bit, haven't I? That would be nice. The sun's warmth is just coming through there, which is nice. There's a yellow pot boy there. Oh, he didn't mention the yellow boy. Which side do I go from the yellow boy? Watch me fall down. Nearly. Yeah, there's a chance of, uh, of a ray down here. I'm about in line with the boat, slightly left. He didn't mention that yellow thingy mooring boy there. So the tide's coming in. We're going to heave both of these out. And then I'm going to grab some brekkie and probably get a brew on. He didn't exactly have a great sleep. Some weird, weird ass dreams. What on earth goes on in a human being's head? Fighting a six foot cat once. Six foot. <laughs> That's a lot of pussy early in the morning.
right, here we are. Back at the top of the beach, we've got a bit of a mess down there. I'm trying to walk two rods up. And it looks like the lines are at least apart. I want to make sure. I don't think I'm going to get a hound here, smooth hound, because I've got no squid and I've got no crab. But I'll make sure these drags can actually give line. I don't want it ticking out so I don't see it going in the tide. That's it, safety. Safety is what you want. I want to at least have got some reels. In fact, what I'm going to do is just pile a little bit over the top here, give it a bit of weight. So if anything does slam me fast, hopefully that will help stop the tripod tipping over. Why is that one not pulling over? I like a little bit of tension there. That's it, got it. I think we're okay. Okay, guys. Time to get some sort of water. There's heat coming through that sun now. Oh, time to get some brekkie going. Wow, this looks pretty convenient, people. There's even a nice flat spot. To put the chair here. Watch the rods and have some brekkie. What I've done is got my cool box obviously in the car with a couple of those freezer packs in there. That enables me to keep my milk cool from going off. He says hopefully. Couldn't get to oh sweet. Nothing wrong with that at all. And then what I do in here oh sooner or later I'll be able to afford a radio mic. Let's put that camera back up there. I've got my uh, cornflakes and raisins in here, nice big healthy healthy diet. Well, you'd think it's a healthy diet, but then yesterday listening on the radio coming down, I was listening to some doctor's programme or something. It was on radio, whatever. And uh, I put the milk around the wrong side. And they're saying that the diabetes levels are caused by, I thought I want to say, was it carbohydrates that turn into sugar? So never mind that you don't have sugar. They say it doesn't matter that I don't put sugar on these cornflakes and raisins. That carb, I think it was carbs turn to starch. Or they are starchy and they turn to sugar naturally. So yes, we've all been there. I'm sure some people out there have put sugar on their cornflakes. Well, what they're saying is don't because it's an accident waiting to happen when you're later in life. So I don't anyway, because I know there is sugar in the raisins. But I mean, they're talking about orange juice as well. Well, I have orange juice, cornflakes and raisins in the mornings, and I think that's healthy healthy food. Oh, apparently it's no good for me. What in God's name, what are we left to eat? I mean, it's easier for fish, isn't it? I mean, fish have no problem at all. They've got no choice today. They've got mackerel, well, they have. They've got mackerel, ragworm, and sand eel. I don't know what it is, starch, diabetes, fish diabetes or what, but that's what they're going to eat, I hope, today. Mmm, what a view, what a view. See, the thing is, all this is a lot of effort. I mean, in a minute I'll be 67, and I've done probably harder fishing now than I've ever done in my life before, but years ago when you were younger, you just did all this stuff, you just slept on the beach, you slept by a lake, by a river, or whatever it was, whatever it took to go fishing, you just went fishing. And now it's in so much more effort. But I just say to people out there, if you don't make the effort, all of a sudden, you won't be able to make the effort. That's a trick. You absolutely have to push yourself. One day, probably, I'm not gonna be able to do all this you know, long fishing expeditions, pushing his body to a few hours sleep a night and marching two miles up and down these awful boulder strewn beaches down at Somerset. But by golly, they got fish down here. I'll tell you what, I would sooner walk some distance over awkward boulders and get some film for you people for a fish than say up my way where it's flat calm, you drive the car up, get out the car and fish you know, in front of you on a beach and catch nothing. Graham, you're doing that at the moment, mate. You're pulling up with a car, the beach is there, and you're catching nothing. Of 
Well, the number of times I've slept in the back of this, well, this car, many, many other cars, state cars. As long as I can lay flat. Now, <clears throat> ostensibly, this is an empty one, but I've been, hopefully, slightly prudent with spending money. Careful, shall we say. And this is my son, so that's extra careful, because it's free. I've had to replace it by a new one, but I still can't help squeezing enough gas out of this to make another brew. It's so satisfying. When you think it's empty, it's always empty. No, 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 it's not empty. Leave it in the sun for the gas to expand and give it a really, really good shake up. Because it's liquid in here, isn't it? And I'm going to get yet another free cup of tea out of this little machine. So remember that. It's going to expand in the heat. Um, it won't expand at all because I haven't got the lighter. It's going to expand in the heat. That helps pressurise the gas. Give it a good shake up and hopefully, hopefully, yes, nearly no moustache. Face it there. You cannot beat, I mean I have drunk some absolute rubbish out of flasks for years, but you can't beat a good fresh cup of tea. It's a weird wind this morning. I mean, we've got a high pressure system. A low went through yesterday, so we got rain. I'm gonna have to shield that, I can hear, hear the flames are uh, getting knocked around. And it's sort of gone back to high pressure, and it's got like a northeasterly wind. Put this stuff in. Let's catch your wife's food bag, at night. Yeah, it's got like a northeasterly wind in it. It's coming. That's east up the Bristol Channel, it's coming about here, sort of swirling around a little bit. But from here I can see my rods over there. I can see the rod tops. But why I like to put a bit of tension in the rod tops is because that way I can see a slack line by it. Ordinarily if I just had straight rods like this and I had a slack line against a skyline and this I can... Oopsie. Unless I can see the line fall slack, I would never know. And if there are any bigger fish in here, it's maybe a larger bass, rays, Maybe a smooth hound, though I don't think I'm going to pick a smooth hound up. I won't see that drop back bite, and that's quite important because generally a drop back is a bigger fish breaking out the lead. Only a big fish will do that. You know, four pounds, five pounds, six pounds, something like that. So if I got it under tension like this, and I'm looking at a pair of rods, if I see one suddenly like this, I can nip over there and know that I've got a slack line bite. It's a theory anyway. Theories. My life is full of theories when I think about it. That's a bit better. Nice cup of tea. <clears throat> what I'm thinking about is, obviously I can see my tea rods over there, motionless as per normal. I've got some ragworm in there that uh, Craig's left me. I wonder, because I thought about it last night, you know when we were bass fishing, I saw one bass in front of me, three of us, bear in mind, Charlie I think was an ex-junior England international George is just a fishing machine, and I never, and I'm stupid, I know, but there's three of us who have never caught anything at all. In the right place, the right time, flood tide, evening, should have been bass there, George got that one that came off. I, I wanted to use bait, I wanted to use a popped up ragworm off the bottom. I, I wonder if I might chuck it down there, a spinning rod, one of those little, not a poly ball, it's like a little floater ball thing that raises a bait off the bottom. I think I might try that. I've got nothing to lose, except the tackle. Graham, don't do it. Why not do it? I think I'm gonna do it, guys. So how I've rigged this up, I've got this, uh, whatever it is, Namura small, I think it's Namura reel, that one, and the kanji rod. Yes, yeah, Namura. It is, it says, 2.48 meters kanji, casting weight 40 to 80 grams. I'm right up here, I only found this today, and I've had it, what, a couple of years? There's the words there. 
This is unbreakable. My God, an unbreakable fishing rod, is there such a thing? But it is a really nice rod. It's one of my favorite rods, it's caught a lot of fish on it. Quite a big fish, actually. So my rig, I've made a sliding boom here. I'm hoping you people can see this. Look, sliding boom, an expendable old roll of lead, just a, you know, weight that's gonna get snagged and probably will get snagged. I've gone through the bead twice and knotted it there, okay? Then I've got a short distance here to the hook. And then I was about a two O, is it, that hook? And I've got one of these pop-up beads and I've gone through that twice so it sort of locks it. So if I go slack, I can move it like that and I'm going to put a ragworm on here and then put the pop-up right next to it. Here's how I'm going to do it. Very nice little bait bag that Craig's left me here. Don't particularly want a huge ragworm, just a ragworm. That one would do nicely. There we go. It's just something to try. Hey, this is a tail of a ragworm. It's a half a ragworm. I don't want to catch half a fish, do I? Maybe they're all small ones. Come out. And these are nice and cool, I have to say. There's a nice ragworm. So, tail, pointy end, tiny little pinches. Go through the pointy end with the pinches there. It's about th mouth, throat, call it what you like. I like to get a little bit of wet on the shank of the hook like that, juice or spit, just so it, it'll roll around easier. Probably, gone, not, probably because I've normally got rust all over my hooks. I'm gonna thread it around, they're gonna just pop it over the eye. Look at that juice coming out. Man, I could eat that myself if I had enough those cornflakes. Now, I'm gonna slide that pop up just there and hopefully it's gonna fish like this. That's the, uh, that's the principle behind these. I just chuck it, I just gotta lob it 20 or 30 yards to see what's there. It's gotta be worth a shot. Well, both rods are still straight out there. Not a sniff. There's a brick wall running out along there, which one assumes ties up with the marker over here. Just as a point of interest, this is flooding. It's a flood tide, so it's going to run from west to east. It's going to go left to right. I figure it's going to run harder on the edge because there's a big cut round in this bay round here over by that headland. So any tide flooding up this way is going to get kicked off a bit by that headland. That's my way of looking at it. So it's going to be pushed out. When it starts to ebb, it's going to go this way. All that volume and area of water is going to come churning along here. And I think it's going to pull a lot harder on the ebb. I may be wrong, no doubt the locals will be able to tell me where I'm going wrong. But that's how I would think that the ebb actually pulls harder than the flood. Now I've got two grip leads out there. One, two. This doesn't have a grip lead, I'm not going that far, but I don't want it dragging with any current into my other lines. So I'm just going to throw it slightly, very slightly right. Who knows if this works, right? All a lighting experiment, isn't it? 30, 40 yards. Not a bad depth there, actually. I'm going to go back up here. Oh, there's another man down there. Hi, hi everybody, hi. People up there think, who's that man waving to himself for? And of course, I can easily fish. Oh, 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 oh. My third rod from the same holder, because you'll see my shotgun tube there, specifically for spinning rods, just to chuck anything light out as a sort of, as a sort of bonus. That's all it is. So, as you can see, I'm all set up. Two big rods out there, big baits. Little rod down there with that uh, popped up ragworm. Probably gonna blank, but you never know. The bait is a soaking, there's always a chance. Plus, Craig's turning up at 12 o'clock, so fingers crossed he's gonna know another mark. I think we're gonna go down to uh, left in somewhere, fish a low water mark. A pleasant enough morning anyway.
Well, it is uh, quarter to nine, guys. And you can see down here is a tide line just down there. That must be the last of the high water tide line. So I guess in the next, might even be top of the tide now. Might be top of the tide now. I don't know if it's going to start pulling left. So it'll be interesting to see how, our, how hard that tide uh, does pull left. I think it's heavy now. Well, all we've got to do now is hang around till midday and wait till Craig turns up because it looks like there's no fish on this beach. Oh, having said that, I just need a little fish jump out. I'm going to have to bring that pop-up rag wing right in the margins. Maybe we're putting a lure out there, you know, people. One of those weird mornings. Well, back of the car. Yes, blank. So, just to bring you out to speed, nice little session down at the flat surf beach. We had those small little school bass. Evening session spinning with lures, El Blanco, except for the one George lost. Third session here after my all night in the car. El Blanco, Craig comes down, helps me out, he's down there. We're packing up and moving, he's just moving his gear, winding just down here, even with Craig, El Blanco. So we got one last throw of the dice, guys. A low water mark further around the corner there, because this, as we drops down, is not so good. He says a low, wa wa low water mark around the corner. I need some sleep. Right around the corner, we're going to walk all the way down there. Let the tide go down, it's big boulders. So we can't fish at high water because your line gets snagged with your lead in the boulders and it's a long cast to reach the sand. So basically we're following the tide down, which gives us the distance to get down onto the sand. We've got about three hours down, three hours up there, after which I'm going home. Fingers crossed we can show you a decent fish. bait we're going to be using guys down here nice crisp fresh frozen sand eels they've got a bit of color to them they've got plenty of oil in them these because when they mince up for a shark worry dubby they uh, do seem to throw out a bit of oil so i'm gonna get some bait thread and get those guys on a hook not sure what you're going to hear sound wise here because what happens is the uh let's get the hook in there the actual mic, and this applies to our, all of our cameras really, they tend to pick up these waves behind and that breaks up the actual voice sound. We can't seem to adjust it. If we, have, if, if, if we adjust in the edit suite the sound upwards, it also brings up the wind noise, the surf noise, stuff like that. Now, I've threaded that one up so it's straight like that. Then a bit of bait elastic to bind it on the hook. Now I'll probably have to give this one a good heave ho and hope nothing comes adrift. I might even cast without clipping the bait down so I want to make sure up here that that bait is clear. I've also got to make sure that I cast past all these bolt boulders onto the sand. I'll check with Craig first if I'm able to cast that far, am I going to reach the sand? Is it 100 yards, 80 yards? There's a little bit of breeze up now. And that might kill off my distance. The trouble is you try and cast too hard and you might get a crack off or something bizarre happening. I'm hoping you're seeing this on there. But the bait is in your pocket, Graham. So there's a pretty well, a nice fresh bait with a bit of guts coming out as well. Hand wipe. This is what you've got to watch people, just negotiating these boulders. These things weigh like 50 to 60 pounds, some of these each, if not more. And the thing is with a falling tide, you know it's falling because if you can see here's the barnacles, with a falling tide, they're wet. They ain't great when they're dry. When they're wet, they're pretty lethal. A broken ankle here is not what we need to be filming. Do I take my time, pick my way as a wobbly one? And what else has happened here? Craig said they had a big storm and it's loosened all these big boulders. Whereas before they were like bedded down apparently and they were you could tread on them and they didn't wobble. Now look, 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 see, look, see these wobble. Some of the other that one's moving. Be so careful. 
So I'm going to send this one out unclipped, I think, people. Someone's telling me to. I just want to make sure it's clear. I've got a giant seven ounce lead on there. Watch your footing, get a good footing, guys. Which I haven't got. Man, this is difficult. I'm just going to lump it out there as best I can. Ooh. I'm hoping that's going to reach the sand. Well, there's a tide there. Yes, I think I'm just on the sand. I just dared to move it one bit. Just a little bit of a ripping tide. These are neeps, and that's what you... I'm not even sure I'm going to fish a second rod, to be honest. Craig's over there binding the bait up. He's all keen. He's all keen to get that bait in the water, aren't we all? Just do not fall over, Graham. How many millions... Oh, shit! How many millions of tons are in here, people? Look at them. Look at the size of that one. Already, since I've cast this out, people, the tide has dropped. Look, from there to there. I'm going to move my tripod down, and I've managed to jam my rod up there before I even throw the second rod out, even bait the second rod up. Wow. I think I could uh, take a job training at the Bolshoi Valley after dancing over this lot. Wow, these wet ones are really slippery. I'm going to go up tide a bit, guys. Oh, wow. This is why you need to have somebody like Craig with you as a guide, because he knows where to go, which areas are dangerous. And of course, should anybody have a slip, anything like that, he's there to help. A bit nerve-wracking for casting, for sure. I'm going to send this one out unclipped as well, people. I just want to make sure it's out there. Well, I want a halfway back cast, actually. I think I've got two good baits that are clear. shore fishing um, anywhere in the UK it's really important to use a, a good shock leader um, and obviously having a good strong shock leader knot um, is just as important as well because when you do get get snagged up you want half a chance of, of getting your gear back right this uh, is a spider hitch um, leader which I, I quite I use quite a lot I uh, find it very effective for pulling out of, pulling out of snags first of all I'll get a my main line I'll double it up probably sort of 30 35 centimeter doubled up then I just hold the two together and make a loop and pinch it. Then I go round my finger once, twice, three times through the loop, like so, moisten it and then tighten it up. Pull for, for a few seconds and then just relax and, and that pulls the knot nice and tight. Always in important to use saliva um, not to, to melt the line through friction and heat. Trim your tag off so you've got a knot and you've, you've basically got a loop like so. Probably about six to eight inch loop. We've got got the loop there sort of six to eight inches of loop of line there. I'm going to secure that between my legs quite tightly. Grab my leader which is 60 pound Berkeley Trilene which is a fantastic strength leader. Uh, through the loop then pull a four or five inches of the, the leader through then put a kink in it in the loop so that's all equal it's really imperative that that loop is equal otherwise it won't work so you pull that tight and then we get this leader tag and we'll run that down once twice three times around the loop and then we have to pull push that through the loop the same way as the other one came out and then you can see on my finger that 
the thing. Loosen up and then just pull it tight. And we've got a, a tag there. I'll just cut that tag off. Never melt them with a the lighter, you say, Craig? Uh, you can do, I, I, I don't. Uh, and the, that's the, the knot there. You've got two knots. People might think, oh, there's two knots. Just double the amount to catch the weed on, but it's going to catch on one, so it's not going to catch on two. So anyway, but that's a really strong, real strong leader knot. Uh, you've got sort of double strength in your line there. And generally when the knot breaks, it breaks here. Um, it breaks the loop. Um, but it takes a hell of a lot of pressure to break that. You know, I think you're talking, it's probably about a 70-80% um, breaking strain break. So if, if you've got a 20 pound line, it's gonna break under sort of 15 pound of pressure. Well, people, it won't be all bad here. Even if we don't catch a fish, we will survive. Because behind me, Craig is actually firing up a frying pan with some sausages. I'm gonna check them out, see what sort of sausages are. We got a sort of bushcraft, like not catch and cook, but we're going to survive. So those rods will have to look after themselves at the moment. Because once that sizzling smell of sausages comes wafting across the uh, beach, there'll be anglers. Well, anglers coming from are those anglers down there. You won't see them with his camera. They're about 300 yards away on the point there. If they smell those sausages cooking, I think they're going to be down here. They have to be fast because I'll eat some. So what are we eating? What are we dining on, Craig? Oh, we're eating healthy today. Gonna go for well and good reduced fat sausages. All part of keeping healthy. Cholesterol free. Exactly. Hopefully, yeah. A few more years fishing. And uh, see wholemeal, wholemeal brown rolls as well. I'll go back healthier than I came back. <laughs> came down here. Important to eat food when you're fishing. Can't concentrate without it. You do this when you do your guiding trips sometimes, um, do you, Craig? Some, sometimes when weather allows. Obviously going out in a pouring rain and howling gales, cooking sausages is not ideal. Yeah. But um, as and when. Try, try to support my clients. Exactly, I bet they like it, even yeah, if they don't definitely. catch a fish, they've exactly. got, to, they've got something, at least, at least have a decent bite anyway, at least. Yeah. What sort of time do you give them for your guiding, Craig? You know, what are you, um, what's sessions, a sort of average day in the summer? Sessions are generally between four and six hours, depending on the venue and the conditions. Uh, so anything between that, really. So it obviously depends on the mark and the conditions. So. And, and getting there, you know, access and stuff like that takes yeah, time get, to get yeah, there. Yeah, and, and, and how is that? Sometimes it might take sort of 40 minutes, half an hour, of, of walking but that that we you know generally four to six hours in the session from start to finish well we've been about 15 minutes no nibbles yet ties putting really hard left quite a bit of weed in the water and a bit of color where it's stirring up with the tides dropping lower onto the sand i assume but there's always color down here but there's no shortage of somewhere to park your butt it's just with all these boulders i can't seem to find a flat one Anyway, it is what it is. Just look at the barnacles here, guys, I'll show you. These are all the barnacles, look, they're just there. They give you a bit of grip walking over. And when you see barnacles like this, you know that's going to be covered with water. So it's a little tip for avoid getting, getting cut off anywhere. That sort of applies to anywhere. You're looking for weed growth and things like barnacles, limpets, anything like that. It tells you there's life on the rock. That means it gets covered by seawater. If it gets covered by seawater, you got to be very careful you don't get cut off. Some of the marks that Craig does take his uh, people to, when he does his guiding, you do definitely, you could get cut off a couple of them. And I wouldn't entertain, and I know where they are, further up the coast, I wouldn't entertain going on my, on my own because each tide is different and the wind can affect the tide differently as well. Make it come in quicker, maybe hold it back. So if you do want to fish some of the good places, you get in touch with Craig and uh, Hopefully he'll point you in the right direction, or if not, take you on a guided session and leave you in with a shout at a good spot. Hopefully we at least see one fish, please. It's not a lot to ask, is it? Great setting though, I have to say. Oh, ketchup as well. Oh my brown word. Brown sauce. <laughs> Got me done. Brown sauce? Yeah, I'll go for whatever's going. Good yeah. man. Thank you very much, Thank Craig. You. Thank welcome. you. Bon appétit. Uh, napkins? Serviettes. <laughs> <laughs> Serviettes. <laughs> Lovely guys. Hmm.
Uh, one, one bait I've found particularly effective over the last couple of years for the smooth hounds is a spider crab. Um, it's a spider crab peeler, obviously, that, that being the, um, the main reason we can use it. If it wasn't a peeler crab, it would just, it'd just be more as impossible. But like all crabs, they molt, um, and this one is in a, is in a molting stage. Uh, it's been frozen, and I've just defrost, we've just defrosted it. I'm going to show you how to how to prepare it. Firstly, get hold of the crab, you pull the pull the legs off, like so, and put them to one side. You might need a pair of pliers uh, because some of the a lot of spider crabs got sharp spines and, and spikes, and they'll just take make short work of your skin. So I prefer to get a, a pair of pliers and just sort of crush crush it without damaging the flesh underneath. Just just gives you a little bit. A bit more assistance really. I concentrate on the leg sockets first. If you just go around pulling the legs off you're highly likely to pull a big chunk of the flesh out. Once I've taken those legs, crushed the leg sockets, you can just use your fingers just to pull off the shell like so. And you can see just underneath the shell there is the new, the new shell which would have um, hardened up over time. Uh, I also like to peel the legs. Uh, they can assist in covering up the, the slimy goo um, to stop it dissolving on impact of the sea on the sea. Um, similar process, just crush the shells. You might need a, well, you're going to need assistance of a pair of pliers. The secret's not to damage the meat underneath. Don't, though, Craig, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't damage the fresh stuff underneath. Yeah. Otherwise, it just gets all mushy. Would you use that as a bait on its own right? Uh, you, you could do. I, I, I don't tend to use it the leg on its own, but you could. Um, I tend to sort of get the get the crab claw like so, cut it in half, and I and I'll lay that over the open flesh um, when I bait up. Just protects it on the cast. Right now we've got uh, most of the undercarriage um, peeled away. You can see there's all the, the nice fresh flesh underneath. What a nice. This is a, a good tip though for the next process. When you turn it around to take the top shell off, you're gonna find you're gonna spike yourselves on these sharp spikes. So what I tend to do is hold it in my hand, get my scissors and just clip away any of those sharp spikes you can see, which are gonna have, could potentially stab you in the hand, get a shot of them. Now you can begin to just pull away underneath, the, underneath their lungs, this brand here. Now I've pulled the, a bit of the shell away, the top shell will come away quite nicely, uh, exposing all this, this lovely stuff here. Next thing, I like to pull up this side, just on the side panels here. And you can see the lungs, or the dead man's fingers, or what people call them. I like, you know, I like to take those away, apparently, you know, their fish don't like them. I don't know how people would know that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that though. They're not eating those on a fresh crab anyway, are yeah, they? Yeah, a human wouldn't eat them. Um, I, I shouldn't think a fish is going to gonna sort of like shell them out or anything, but you never know. It's better to be safe and sorry. It's not going to do any harm to remove them. And there's a little bit of crusty white shell here. Just sort of like squish it out and put it out. Any other little bits of shell you might find en route to it. So that's those, that side done. And again, same again this side. There's another set. You can see all this nice juice coming out. Just remove those those lungs. It looks like roadkill to me at the moment, Craig. Oh, very <laughs> much so. <laughs> and it's not exactly the easiest thing to bait up with either. Easiest when they're fresh, they're a lot easier. Once they've been frozen, they become really, really delicate. And you know, if you're too heavy-handed, you're just going to end up with a just complete mush. I'm going to be as gentle as I can, and it's still going to end up in quite a bit of mush. Right. That's pretty much the, the crab shell. There's a few um, few bits and pieces in there and get rid of that. As, as you know, as you go along, you find bits you can pull out. But anyway, there, there's the completed peeled one. First of all, I'm gonna cut it straight down the middle. And it's looking like off this, you're gonna get four decent sized baits, potentially six smaller baits. So we've got half a crab here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut, try and cut these into three, so each half into thirds. That's one, two, so we've got 
lot of juice in there, Craig, There's for the fish to smell in there. Hell of a lot, yeah. And that's going to need some sort of protection because um, that's going to, as soon as that lands on the, the on the cast, on the on the, when the it impacts, yeah. yeah, on the impact of the surface, it's just going to dissolve on the surface. It's going to be no good to no one. So we have to protect that a little bit. As you can see, we've got six six good baits there out of that one crab. Uh, for the next stage, um, we're going to use a baiting tool, uh, which is pretty much it. Just helps so much when you're doing it. Right, they've, they've six quite generous sized baits actually. To be fair, probably could have stretched to eight smaller ones, but I've gone for gone for six here just to make just to explain it and demonstrate how to bait it up easier. Right, so I'm just going to go for for this chunk here. You see, it's a bit of a quite a squarish chunk. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to manipulate it a little bit to elongate it a bit. I'm going to stick it on onto a baiting tool. I'm going to go back to the the legs, um, which I peeled earlier. You can see this orange juice here, that's all the scent. Really, if we were to bait that up now on the cast on impact, that's gonna dissolve on the, on the, on the surface of the, of the sea. So I'm gonna put a couple of legs over the top of it. Grab hold of me elastic. And just elasticate that to the, the baiting tool. Just helps keep that juice in there, I guess. It does, yeah. It just keeps it all there. You know, the bait is so soft anyway. A lot of it's just going to come oozing out anyway, but it's totally soaking into the into the bait. And it's a mucky old business. You were telling me that's a different type of baiting thread. Yeah, it's the uh, the tub's a bit a bit worn now, but you can just see the. Tronics Pro there, but it's uh, Tronics Pro released it uh, a couple of years ago, a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, it's a latex, comes in a uh, fine, medium, and heavy, uh, and even the heavy is like mega, mega fine, but strong as anything. Um, the stretch on it is pretty amazing, and um, yeah, it's good stuff. I definitely favour it. Trick is not to be too shy with the with the elastic. Just you know, get plenty of it on there. Right, I'm gonna get the hook. And again, with the baiting tool, just it helps the baiting up. Got a hook, gonna nick the hook just in the, in the bait there. Get it in there, that is. Gonna clip it in there, turn it round, and then put the hook securely behind that shepherd hook type of um, hold there. Now I'm gonna prep, depress on the thumb on the hook of the eye to push it in. And I'm going to elasticate that eye tight to the bait and then literally elasticate it up the hook length and keep it in place. That's to make the hook point stand out proud, it is, is yeah, it, Craig? Yeah, that's it, yeah. The last thing you do is you don't want your hook buried in the bait because there's just like pretty much zero hookability of a fish. So you want to keep those hooks well clear of the bait. A lot of people make that mistake of that the hooks are masked in the bait and just they, they get a, sort of a half a hook up but nothing. Lose a fish. Lose, yeah, a lose fish. a fish, basically. Get it halfway in and it falls off because it was only the fish are just holding onto it. All right, now that's on one of the hooks. They've got a top panel here. And I'm just going to hook that in there. Turn that around. Put up any slack. Ready to Tid go. Tidy up any bit of tidy elastic, which we've got a bit kicking around here. And you bury that uh, elastic into, his, into the meat. You don't need to tie half it. Show you like yeah, no, it, I, I, I it sometimes buries into the meat, I, yeah? I do sometimes, but sometimes it just the, the, the latex is so so stretchy, it just digs in and just cuts in. So, yeah. and that's it really. A lovely spider bait. And it's, it's an effect. I've had some. I've had uh, specimen small eye rays on it, uh, thornback rays on it, conger eels on it, codling on it. And plenty of smooth downs in the last couple of years. And spiders through the summer, all through, or there's a specific time yeah, the in the UK. The spiders sort of molt about this time of year now. We sort of round about sort of early June to early July. Um, they tend to molt depending on the temperature. Uh, not not round here, but more in the North Devon coast. Um, and you can collect plenty of them. It's a bit of a walk to get them, but you can get them. Um, this one here has been in the freezer since last year. Yeah, these are, these are self-collected, by the way, guys. Yeah. These aren't something you just walk in a tackle shop and buy, are they? Uh, we we we've had you a do few. stock a few. We yeah. do we get a few, not many though. We just we get a few here and there. Um, no one asks for them. We just they're just there for those who do ask. The specialists. Yeah, you, know, you don't <laughs> want to say if someone confidence in, in a bait is is one thing. If you go around pushing a bait like this to to someone who's not really sure how to use it, they're going to be they're going to get it and feel like they've 
wasted their money buying something that they can't use. Yes. Because yeah. it, it, you know, it's not exactly, well, you can see the state of my hands, look at it, it's, yeah. it's not easy. It's not an easy task. No, no. But yeah, it's deadly bait, absolutely deadly. When I use uh, cocktail baits, I like to use one of these double baiting uh, tools. Basically, it makes, makes life so much easier and it keeps the, uh, the bait, bait nice and straight. First of all, I get to the moment, for this bait, I'm gonna use a, a sand eel and bluey combo cocktail. So what I'm gonna do is kebab the sand eel onto one of the pins and then slide a strip of bluey just under the skin onto the other pin and then just lay the two side by side level them up so basically what I've done is cut the head and tail of the sand eel and I've cut a piece of bluey to the same length as the sand eel and then what I do is push the two together flesh of the bluey on the outside because most of the oil's in that then I'm going to do is just a few turns of Baytex just to keep it in place get the hook, this is where the, the tool comes in handy, just going to push the hook between the two bits of bait there, turn it round, just clip it underneath that hook there, pull that hook out of the way, and continue securing the two baits, you can see the line there, we we'll lay the line over the sand eel, just elasticate the line to the bait. Just work your way up and down, down to the bottom, around a few times, then back up, and then go back down, and back up. I go up about sort of three to four times, and then just finish it off with half a dozen turns there to secure it. And then to slide it off, you just got to push it forward, twist the hook to release, and just pull that out, and set the hooks back in there. And you can see it's actually quite a, a nice straight bait. If you were to do that by hand, it just it could potentially end up like, like a banana. You put you get twists in it, don't you, Craig? Yeah, I've, done, just, I've done it myself. Yeah, I haven't got a baiting needle, see, no. guys. But what, yeah, if it just it just twists and bends. And it's spinning in the air, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it just spins in the air. You lose lose yards on the cast, and quite often it can fly and spin through the air, wobble, and just come off the baiting clip, bait clip as well. Yeah, so yeah, that's but that's right, it's just yeah. just a perfect tool for, to make a, a good streamlined bait. Yeah. The sand in and bluey. You can see you've got the flesh of the bluey there, and obviously you've got the sand in there. Good combo nice. bait. Yeah, good for rays. Um, specific, specific, no, especially uh, thornbacks, but small lines would take a bit of fishy squid sand in, So It is, as the surroundings say, rock hard this fishing. <laughs>